Jack Johnson meets world heavyweight champion Tommy Burns. Sydney, Australia, 26th of December, 1908. Here's Tommy Burns getting himself into the best shape of his entire career. In nine days, Tommy will defend his title against the scourge of the heavyweight ranks, Jack Johnson. And Tommy knows that this is going to be the fight of his life. Here's champion Burns, the shorter of the two men, training with the fine heavyweight Al Kaufman, whom he sends to the canvas with a good right hand. Watch closely. Johnson is training 17 miles away at Rushcutters Bay. Even the sedate Australian sports writers have been pulling out all of the stops in describing Johnson's workouts throughout his training period. There has been a general consensus of opinion that Johnson combines perfect defense and balance with an offensive punching attack which leaves little to be desired in a professional fighter. This is the scene at Rushcutters Bay in Sydney, Australia at 1 o'clock in the afternoon as an electric excitement has captured the fans as they prepare to watch Burns make the 12th defense of his heavyweight championship. This is how Tommy Burns appeared as he was introduced as the defending heavyweight champion of the world. Never was a champion more ready to defend his laurels. In round one, Tommy Burns, to the left of your screen, moves out and boxes cautiously. Johnson clinches with Tommy and smiles to ringsiders. Burns looks almost like a little boy compared to the 212-pound challenger. But while he's not a heavyweight by the normal standard of height, there have been 50 professional heavyweights, mostly over six foot tall, with all of their height lying horizontal on the canvas, knocked flat by this same Tommy Burns. Johnson lands a hard right and forces Tommy to the ropes. Johnson rushes in and scores with a punishing left at the end of round one. In rounds two, three, and four, Johnson merely played with the heavyweight champion. He would laugh and actually talk to the crowd as Burns was hitting to the stomach. It was Johnson's way of demonstrating he had absolutely nothing to fear from the little heavyweight champion. Here in round five, Johnson has no trouble in tying his man up. Jack Johnson was born in Galveston, Texas on March 31st, 1878. At 30 years of age, he's three years older than champion Burns. Johnson is six foot one and a half inches tall and weighed in for this fight at a beautifully proportioned 212 pounds. Burns stays at long range, looking for an opening. Early in his professional career, Johnson was nicknamed Little Arthur. He looks almost like a giant next to the little man he's facing. As we come to the end of round five, it's apparent that Burns is almost at an insurmountable disadvantage against this magnificent fighting machine, Jack Johnson.
In rounds six and seven, Johnson scored heavily on the inside with ripping punches to the body and hard rights to the head. Here in round eight, Johnson rushes in and holds Burns as he talks to ringsiders, laughing all the time. Johnson has been after this heavyweight title fight for over two years. He hurled challenge after challenge at Burns to no avail. Johnson employed the unique strategy of purchasing a ringside seat at every one of Burns' title defenses. As Tommy fought, Johnson would sit there screaming insults, taunting the champion. His high voice stood out like a beacon light at ringside when Burns fought Philadelphia Jack O'Brien. At Dublin, when the champion beat Jim Roach, Johnson was there screaming. Again in Paris, when Burns knocked out Joey Smith, and finally in Sydney, when Burns disposed of Bill Squires. It was then, in Sydney, Australia, that the champion could take no more. Burns simply can't do anything on the inside with this bigger, more powerful challenger. Tommy Burns' real name is Noah Brusso. A French-Canadian by birth, he was born June 17, 1881, in Hanover, Canada. A good right uppercut. Another ripping right uppercut by Johnson. Uppercuts, hooks, all punishing blows. Johnson calmly looks down at Tommy, talks to the champion, taunting him. He wants Burns, as well as everyone, to know that this is no fight. This is a picnic. See how Johnson practically ignores the champion on the inside at the end of round eight. In rounds 9 and 10, Johnson simply overwhelms the champion. Going into round 11, it looked practically hopeless for Tommy. Johnson pressing forward, landing short punches, holding Tommy in the clinches. Burns unable to do anything against the heavier, stronger, taller challenger. Johnson turned professional 11 years ago, in 1897. He had 10 professional fights when in 1901 he was KO'd in three rounds by Joe Schuwinski. But following that contest, Johnson KO'd 25 opponents in the next seven years. He has met and defeated all of the great fighters of his time, including George Gardner, Sam McVie, Joe Jeanette, Sam Langford, and the great Bob Fitzsimmons. Johnson closes in, completely tying up the champion. He forces Burns back in the clinches and literally handles the champion with ease. As round 11 comes to an end, there is almost a general feeling of compassion for the impossible task which Burns has undertaken. Round 12 was all Jack Johnson. In round 13, it appeared as though the police were going to step in and stop the fight as a result of Burns' weakened condition and the terrible beating he was taking. Here in round 14, Johnson rushes in, lands an uppercut, three left hooks, a tremendous barrage of punches, lefts and rights which have Burns helpless. At this
this very moment, in the early seconds of round 14, the police shut off the motion picture cameras and stepped into the ring awarding the heavyweight championship of the world to Jack Johnson. Here, in slow motion, you can see the blistering attack. Burns was absolutely defenseless just seconds before the police stopped the motion picture cameras and entered the ring to halt this very one-sided fight. Jack Johnson becomes heavyweight champion of the world, December 26, 1908. Jack Johnson defends his title for the first time against Stanley Ketchell. Colma, California, 16th of October, 1909. Here we go into round one. Johnson, much the larger man. He's 209 pounds to Ketchell's 160. A 49 pound weight pull for the big champion. Jack Johnson won the heavyweight title in Australia 10 months before this fight, when he knocked out Tommy Burns. Since then, Johnson has defeated all heavyweight contenders. When Stanley Ketchell, the middleweight champion, challenged Johnson, the whole world became interested in the outcome of this fight. 10,000 people are jammed into this arena. Many thousands more milling around outside, unable to get in. Some of these people traveled thousands of miles to get here. Some fight experts consider Jack Johnson the perfect fighter. He's a master boxer with an almost perfect defense, and he can hit like a ton of bricks. Stanley Ketchell is known both as the Michigan Marvel and the Michigan Assassin. He's a great two-fisted puncher. He's famous for his left shift, in which he moves to his left but comes in fast with a right lead, followed by a left hook, a tricky combination. Johnson has a terrific reach advantage as well as height and weight. Ketchell having trouble trying to get in close enough to land a punch. The end of round one. It's pretty hot under this California sun, and the seconds get to work right away. Now here we go into round two of this 20-round title bout between heavyweight champion Jack Johnson and Stanley Ketchell at Colma, California, October 16th, 1909. Johnson, the bigger man. The crowd yelling at Johnson to fight. Cut out the holding. Jim Jeffries, the retired former heavyweight champion, has promised to return to the ring and regain the title from Johnson if Ketchell doesn't win today. Johnson says he'd be very glad to meet Jim Jeffries in the ring. He claims that Jeffries never would give him a shot at the title, that Jim always was afraid of him. When Johnson fought Tommy Burns in Australia, Jack gave Burns such a terrible beating that the police stopped the fight in the 14th round to save Tommy's life. Ketchell is down! That was a terrific right to the jaw! He takes a count of five. He looks all right. He's still got a lot of fight left in him. Ketchell's seconds keep yelling at him to cover up and make Johnson lead. But Ketchell keeps carrying the fight to Johnson.
Ketchell had figured he could beat Johnson by getting in close and hitting to the body. But it hasn't worked so far. Johnson's been holding him off and outboxing him. When Ketchell does get in close, Johnson ties him up. The end of round two. In the next five rounds, Ketchell keeps carrying the fight to Johnson. The champion seems overly cautious. Let's Ketchell do all the leading and hits only with counter punches. Now here we are in round eight of this 20 rounder between Jack Johnson, heavyweight champion of the world, and Stanley Ketchell here at Colma, California. Jack Johnson, the bigger man, in complete command, smiling confidently, seems to be toying with Ketchell. Johnson's very fast for a big man. He's much faster than he looks. His flat-footed shuffle gives a false impression that he's slow. The crowd yelling at the referee to break him up and make Johnson fight. Ketchell's recognized as one of the truly great fighters, regardless of weight. But this fight with Jack Johnson here today is the great moment in Stan Ketchell's life. If he wins, he'll be the first fighter in all history to hold both middleweight and heavyweight titles at the same time. A half punch, half push sends Ketchell flying across the ring. Shows the great difference in weight and power between these two men. Looks like the old story of a good little man against a good big man. The end of round eight. In the ninth round, Johnson keeps slashing Ketchell's face with a stinging left jab. Now here we go into round ten. Ketchell's face is badly cut up, but Stanley has lots of heart. No one ever denied that Stanley Ketchell is one of the most courageous men ever to step into the ring. Johnson's been boxing very cleverly. He's been letting Ketchell set the pace and wear himself down. So far, Johnson has just been peppering away with his jab and counter-punching. He's using as little energy as possible. Johnson hold Ketchell out. Looks like the champ isn't ready to knock Ketchell out yet. These men hate one another. There's a lot of bitterness between them. Before the fight, Ketchell said some nasty things about Johnson, and Johnson said he was going to punish Ketchell for it. Cut him up badly and then knock him out. Ketchell trying desperately to get in close, to hit the champion into the body. But he can't get through Johnson's clever defense. The left side of Ketchell's face is badly mauled and bruised. Fight is so lopsided, it looks as though Johnson could not catch it out any time he wanted to.
That Johnson's like a panther. The end of round 10. Ketchell's badly cut up and hurt, but Johnson's not even breathing hard. In the 11th round, Johnson smashes Ketchell all over the ring. Now round 12, Colma, California, October 16th, 1909. Johnson is down. It was a terrific right to the jaw. The referee's count seems fast. Johnson's up at eight. He's mad. Ketchell's excited, comes in wide open, takes a right square on the jaw. They're both down. Johnson gets up and the referee counts over Ketchell. The great Stanley Ketchell, the Michigan assassin, is out cold. Jack Johnson retains his heavyweight championship of the world. Jack Johnson defends his title once more against Jim Jeffries. Reno, 4th of July, 1910. One of the great events in sports history is just 24 hours away as we look at downtown Reno, Nevada on July 3rd, 1910. Jeffries retired undefeated in 1904, over six years ago. The city of Reno is in a frenzy as 15,000 fight fans swarm into the little town. This is the fight the entire boxing world has been waiting for. A clash between the two men who are ranked as the greatest heavyweight champions of all time. Let's go back six months to the time when Jeffries first opened his training camp and look at what six years of inactivity has done to the former champion. Here we see Jeff shaking hands with well-wishers. His weight at this time is over 314 pounds. Also visiting Jeff are former heavyweight champions John L. Sullivan to your right and James J. Corbett to your left. There had been an 18-year feud between these two great fighters, which is finally patched up on this very day. To the delight of cameramen, they go through a mock sparring session with the mustache John L. showing some of the feints he used over two decades ago when he was bare-knuckle champion. A final handshake ended all of the bad feeling between the two. We're seeing the stadium being built, which will feature the biggest sporting event of the century. This is the first time in pugilistic history that an arena has been built specifically for one special prize fight. The promoter is the fabled Tex Rickard, who paid $120,000 in gold to capture this sporting plum. It's now July 1st, just three days until Jeffries and Johnson enter the ring. Unbelievably, you are looking at a 226-pound Jim Jeffries. Jeff has done what many experts had predicted was virtually impossible. He has recaptured his fighting form and shed over 110 pounds in the process. On this particular day, he's loosening up in preparation for three rounds of sparring with the legendary Joe Shuwinski. A crowd of over a thousand fight fans is present to watch Shuwinski, a man considered one of the great fighters of the era, demonstrate to Jeffries the various moves he used to whip Jack Johnson, the present champion. Shuwinski, the smaller fighter in long white boxing tights, enjoys a unique distinction in heavyweight history. Not only did he hold Jeffries to a 20-round draw, a remarkable feat considering that Jeffries has never been beaten, but in addition, he knocked out Jack Johnson in three rounds back in 1901, which places Shuwinski in a category with the great fighters of the period. He thinks nothing of giving away as much as 100 pounds to an opponent and then proceeds to knock him out. It's 6.30 in the morning, July 4, 1910. It seems scarcely conceivable that this seemingly carefree James J. Jeffries in just six hours will be in the toughest fight of his life against one of the greatest fighting machines in the history of boxing. At the same time, Champion Johnson takes his morning constitutional. Now at nine o'clock in the morning, the trains are arriving every half hour, bringing fight fans to see the match that has been billed as the Battle of the Giants. No sooner does one trade unload when the next one pulls in jam to capacity. Outside the arena, four hours before fight time, $50 ringside seats are being scalped for $125 each. And in 1910, $125 represented the purchasing power of nearly $7,000 today. Extensive motion picture coverage has been planned as the entire world waits for the results. 20 minutes before fight time, the light heavyweight champion of the world, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, is introduced to the packed stadium. Here's A. Battelle, featherweight champion of the world, and ranked as one of the greatest boxers of all time, regardless of division. But the man who gets the finest ovation is bare-knuckle champion Jake Kilrain, 
fans will never forget Jake's 75 round fight with champion John L. Sullivan. At exactly three minutes to one, a hush settles over the stadium as champion Jack Johnson makes his way through the crowd. Jack always insists on being the first to enter the ring. He takes this superstition so seriously that it's actually part of the conditions of the contract. From the moment Johnson enters the ring, the big golden smile, which is his trademark, never leaves his face. A grimly determined Jeffries enters the ring four minutes later. 16,520 excited fight fans are on the edge of their seats as round one gets underway. The fight is scheduled for 45 three-minute rounds, and the temperature is 110 degrees of suffocating heat. Champion Johnson is in brilliant physical condition, weighing 212 pounds. Jeffries, at 226 pounds, is fighting at the same weight at which he last defended the heavyweight championship in 1904 against Jack Monroe. It was a tremendous task for Jeff to get himself into the rock-hard condition fighter he is today. Jeffries won the heavyweight championship of the world 11 years ago, on June 9, 1899, when he knocked out Bob Fitzsimmons in 11 rounds. After successfully defending the crown seven times in that period between 1899 and 1904, he retired undefeated, having beaten every prominent heavyweight who wanted a chance at his crown. Round one draws to a close with both men conserving their energies, knowing there are a possible 44 rounds to go. As round four begins, neither fighter has gained a clear advantage. In rounds two and three, the two men continued feeling each other out, searching for weaknesses, using early caution. The third man in the ring is none other than promoter Tex Rickard. For weeks, Johnson and Jeffries haggled about who should referee the fight. Rickard attempted to solve the problem by asking the President of the United States, William Howard Taft, to be the referee. When President Taft declined, Rickard then sent a wire to the famous British author of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who also respectfully declined. Finally, Rickard, who has never refereed a prize fight in his life, nominated himself as the third man in the ring. While he was in training, champion Johnson had read the glowing accounts of the giant-like strength of Jeffries. It said that no man living can tie Jeffries up in close. When Johnson heard this, he said that he was not only going to tie Jeffries up in the clutches, but that he was going to actually twist Jeff's arms behind his back in order to completely neutralize the strength of the challenger. Johnson lands a stinging overhand right, which is the best punch of the fight thus far, and round four comes to an end. We go into round 13 with the challenger Jeffries tiring badly. In rounds 5 through 12, Johnson has slowly but methodically worn Jeffries down with hard right uppercuts in the clinches and powerful lefts and rights to the body. The fight is definitely going the way Johnson has planned it. The champion is setting his own pace, letting the years of inactivity, the tremendous heat, and his own powerful punching slowly take their toll on the 37-year-old challenger. When Jeffries retired six years ago, Tommy Burns won general recognition as heavyweight champion by going around the world and defeating every heavyweight who laid claim to the crown. Burns lost his title December 26, 1908, just two years ago to Jack Johnson in Sydney, Australia in a spectacular contest. Johnson returned to the United States and last year, in 1909, successfully defended his title against the middleweight champion of the world, Stanley Ketchell. This is Johnson's second title defense, and Jeffries is considered by far the most formidable opponent that Johnson has ever had to face. Both men are now feeling the effects of this tremendous heat, but it's the champion, Johnson, who definitely appears to be the stronger of the two. A smashing right hand by Johnson is followed by a jolting right uppercut. Champion Johnson is getting a $60,000 guarantee for this title offense, by far the biggest ever made to date. Jeffrey's guarantee is $40,000, plus the astronomical figure of $75,000 for signing with Rickard for the fight. 1,500 Never Say Die fans crashed over the fence when there simply were no more seats to be sold. In Rickard's financial breakdown of the fight, these same 1,500 crashers were listed as complimentaries. In the previous round, Johnson relentlessly pursued Jeffries all over the ring. Here in round 15, he rushes Jeff against the ropes and lands a hard right uppercut. He follows it up with three left hooks, and Jeffries goes down for the first time in his entire professional career. 
The crowd leaps to its feet at the shock of what's happened. Jeff rises and gets hit with a smashing left foot, which sends him out of the ring. Jeff's chief second, with the help of a fan, lifts him to his feet. Johnson rushes Jeffries across the ring, where he floors Jeff with a paralyzing right to the head. Rickard steps between the two fighters as Sam Berger, in dark dressed and hat, rushes in and stops the fight to save Jeffries from further punishment. James J. Jeffries suffers the first and only defeat of his entire professional career, while Jack Johnson successfully defends his World Heavyweight Championship. In his third title defense, Jack Johnson takes on fireman Jim Flynn. Las Vegas, 4th of July, 1912. But first, let's watch Johnson training just two days prior to the fight. Here's champion Jack Johnson sparring with Marty Cutler. Johnson wanted to box on the bare ground instead of the ring because he felt his legs would be strengthened. Spectators paid an exorbitant $5 a ticket to watch this training session. According to Johnson, he hasn't done any training in five months. Johnson is a whopping 245 pounds. A far cry from his solid 200-pound championship form of two years ago. Johnson way overweight. Two days later, it's fight time. Johnson comes out for round one in white trunks. Jim Flynn is in black. Here in Las Vegas, New Mexico, the temperature today is a blistering 95 degrees. Johnson keeping Flynn off of him. Good left jabs by champion Jack Johnson. Johnson began his professional career in 1897, 15 years ago. The same year, gentleman Jim Corbett lost his heavyweight championship to Bob Fitzsimmons. The 34-year-old Johnson won the heavyweight title in 1908, four years ago when he beat Tommy Burns in Sydney, Australia. Jack followed Burns all over the world and finally got the title shot when he was 30 years old. Flynn likes to work in close. Fireman Jim Flynn is a tough, rough-and-tumble battler. He began his professional career in 1901, 11 years ago. The last fight for the 33-year-old Flynn was his knockout over Al Williams in Toronto, six months ago. Last year, Flynn fought ten times without a loss, winning eight times by KO. Johnson seems in complete control here in round one. <laughs> Flynn's most notable effort in the ring was a 10-round draw with the great Sam Lankford. This same Jim Flynn, five years after today's fight, will go on to knock out the great Manasseh Mahler, Jack Dempsey, in the first round in 1917. That feat alone could be called a career highlight. Johnson keeping Flynn off with that long left. Johnson toying with Flynn, smiling at ringsider.
Champion Jack Johnson seems to be in complete control here in round two. Crisp uppercuts on the inside by Johnson. What's this? Flynn is butting. Fireman Jim Flynn is butting. Referee Smith warns Flynn. This is Marcus of Queensbury rules. He motions the two fighters to continue. The referee says to Flynn, stop using your head in there. Now Johnson wants to keep Flynn at long range. Johnson using that uppercut on the inside. A hard headshot by Flynn. The referee warns Jim. Jim continues to butt Johnson. Flynn puts his hands on his hips. Why can't I use my head? The referee says to continue to fight. And that's the end of the round. Johnson continued to control the action during round three. Here in round four, we see the champion still setting the pace. Actually, this is the second meeting of these two fighters. In 1907, five years ago, Johnson KO'd Flynn in the 11th round at San Francisco. Johnson using that beautiful left jab. The referee warns Flynn once again for butting. They cautiously shake hands. Since winning the title, Johnson has defended it twice. Jack KO'd Stanley Ketchell in the 12th round in 1909, and he KO'd the previously undefeated retired heavyweight champion James J. Jeffries in the 15th round in 1910. A marvelous barrage of punches by Jack Johnson. Referee tells Flynn to stay away from that head. And there's the end of the round. The champion continued to dominate in rounds five through eight. Here in round nine, it's clear that Johnson is the far superior fighter. This world championship contest has no schedule limit of rounds. Both men have agreed to fight to a finish until one or the other is stopped. Thus, this fight could conceivably go on until the next day if both men have the strength and condition to continue. Flynn butting again. Flynn using that head. The referee warns Jim. He's got to fight with his hands. What's this? The sheriff is entering the ring and stopping the fight to prevent Flynn from receiving further punishment. The crowd goes wild as it's announced that Johnson is awarded a ninth round knockout win. The great Jack Johnson retains the heavyweight championship of the world in Las Vegas, New Mexico.
on July 4th, 1912. Jack Johnson, rated by many as the greatest heavyweight champion of all time.